How many of us here this morning uh, enjoy doing puzzles? Anybody here? Anybody like puzzles? Maybe many, most of you are probably thinking jigsaw puzzles when I said that, but there are a lot of different kinds of puzzles, aren't there? Uh, there are math puzzles, there are logic puzzles, uh, there's mechanical puzzles, there's word puzzles, there's other kinds. Uh, one of the most popular puzzles today is Sudoku. Uh, how, many, how many of you like to do those? A few of you. I thought there might be more. A few of you, I, I haven't really gotten into that either. Uh, probably a good thing I haven't because I love numbers. I'd probably just spend too much time on it. Uh, but if you haven't, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a logic-based number placement game where you have to fill uh, numbers into squares based on some criteria. And in 2006, a Finnish ma mathematician Arto and Inkala created what is claimed to be the hardest Sudoku uh, puzzle ever, uh, at least until he made it harder, I guess, in 2010. Uh, and he called it the, uh, I guess it's called the AI escar escargot, it's shaped like a snail, the numbers that it starts with. And the AI escargot is supposed to require genius level intelligence to be able to complete it in any, in a short period of time. Now, if I were to uh, put this up on the screen, if I were to put it, I'm not going to, we're not going to play Sudoku today, but if I were to put it up on the screen, this hardest puzzle ever, and let's say one of you, uh, let's say Bob, let's say Bob was just able to look up at the screen and just solve it right away. He did, I put all the numbers in, it's all done. That'd be pretty impressive, wouldn't it? We'd be all be very impressed with Bob. Uh, in, in Romans 9, chapter 9 uh, through 11, the Apostle Paul is dealing here with a challenging puzzle. You might say the hardest puzzle anybody's ever tried to solve. And it's a puzzle about God that it seems that nobody can crack. And yet by the time we get to the end of Romans chapter 11, we find that God has solved the puzzle. And Paul is, shall we say, extremely impressed that God has solved this puzzle that, that people think doesn't have an answer, that people think it is a reason to disbelieve God, to be in disbelief toward God, when in reality it is a, a reason to stand in, in awe with our jaws wide open at the ama in amazement at his glory. So let's read this. It's found this really uh, dramatic conclusion to Romans 9 through 11. And really you could say it's a summary even of everything from Romans 1 through chapter 11. And we're going to begin reading here at Romans 11 verse 32. It says here, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do, with Paul, stand in awe at how you have solved uh, this puzzle. And as we talk about it today, Lord, we know, even from what Paul says here, that you're your ways are ultimately too deep for us, too high for us, unsearchable, in, uh, incomprehensible, past finding out. At some point we reach a point where our mind is blown. I may have reached that point a while back already. Where our mind is blown and we just, we're done analyzing and we just stand in awe and we praise you. And we do that today in awe of you and what an amazing God, not just that you're, a good God who has had mercy on wicked sinners, but that in, in incredible skill, an incredible wisdom and power, you've demonstrated how you have managed to be good, all good, all knowing, and, and all powerful at the same time. Something that we as humans, a puzzle we can't crack without your revelation. So we thank you for the truth this morning. And I pray that we would then have our jaws dropped today 
as we consider what you've done. Even the, the glimpse that we get of it, Lord, I pray that we would be impressed, very impressed with you. And not only that, but to worship you and to bring you glory. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. And as I was reading this passage in preparation for this sermon and as I was preparing it, uh, I got uh, full of uh, fear and trepidation more than I usually would for preparing a sermon because uh, I realized this, this could be uh, the most important sermon I've ever preached. Uh, maybe not the best, but it could be the most important because of the, con- the content of this passage. Because this passage is really the summation of the most profound theology, the most profound truth about God in all of Scripture and thus anywhere in the universe. And it demonstrates for us what our primary response ought to be when we get even a glimpse of what God is really like. Now, a moment ago, I mentioned the, the great puzzles uh, that are solved, and I mentioned this great puzzle that's being presented here in these chapters. And now, like any puzzle, uh, this puzzle could be broken down into many pieces, and we've done a lot of that already. So I'm just going to give you a summary uh, of three that we, things that we saw here in Romans chapter 9 through 11. Number one, we saw that God's chosen nation has failed to receive God's Son. And this brought about the puzzle. Well, hasn't God failed to keep his promises? And we see that in Romans 9, 6. Doesn't this mean that God is not powerful? The second part of the puzzle is, then how can God be trusted if he allegedly makes promises that he doesn't keep? And he chooses to use some people and not others. The charge there is that God must not be all-knowing. How could he possibly do that? How could God possibly have all knowledge from the foundation of the world and yet also allow mankind to have a will and to exercise it? Thirdly, the third part of the puzzle, and we find it in Romans 9, 14, is that then it doesn't seem fair for God to choose one nation and not another. In other words, is God really good? Is he really righteous? Is there unrighteousness with God, as it says there in Romans 9, 14? So you may have noticed, and you may have heard me while I was uh, praying as well, that as I was explaining that, uh, what we have here is, a, is really a specific example, a specific form of an age-old philosophical puzzle that many people think cannot be answered. And it goes like this. How can God be all-knowing, all-good, and all-powerful at the same time? The argument goes like this. If God is all-knowing, let me start over, with the existence of evil as a given. Okay, bad things happen. We all know that. If God is all-knowing, then he knows about the evil. If God is all-good, then he would want to put a stop, an end to the evil. And if God was all-powerful, he would be able to stop the evil. And so the argument goes that if God exists as he's described in Scripture, he really can't, actually, is how the argument goes. He can only be two or less of these things, but he can't be all, of, all three. Yet the Bible clearly describes him as all three, and so much more. In this specific example, if God is all of these things that he says he is, then why would his chosen nation, Israel, fail if he's really all-powerful? Why would God choose a nation that he knew would fail if he's really all-knowing? And what kind of God would choose one group of people over another anyways? Perhaps he's not really good. And so we find here with this puzzle of Israel and the gospel, what we find is that God is using this example to give us just a glimpse of how he consistently solves the puzzle. In other words, how he consistently operates as this perfect God who is perfectly uh, intelligent, all-wise, all-powerful, and perfectly righteous and good in every way, and how he consistently operates on that level all the time, never changing. We just get a little glimpse of that here. In other words, this scenario demonstrates that God is, in fact, all-powerful, all-knowing and all-good 
And you and I can't even comprehend the fraction of it. And, and if I could add to that, to think that we could, could understand these things better than God is the height of foolishness. So let's talk about it. In answer to this puzzle, we find a conclusion about God's two primary purposes in this world. Those two primary purposes are the salvation of man, God's goodness toward man, and the glory of God, God's glory. We saw in verse 28, Romans eleven twenty-eight, that there are two entities in play here working together to fill, fulfill these great purposes. These entities, of course, are Israel and the gospel. And then we saw last week in verses 29 through 32 that there are two explanations given for why God does things the way he does them. Generally speaking, the first explanation is in verse 29 is God is faithful. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He, he, does, not, he does not go back on any of his promises. God is faithful. The second explanation found in verses 30 through 32 is that God is merciful. God is merciful. So we saw last week in, in uh, verses 30 and 31 how Paul explains how God uses these two entities, Israel and the gospel, to the Gentiles to bring salvation to more people than would otherwise would have had the gospel. He wants more people to have the opportunity to obtain mercy. And this is the explanation given. He used the mercy, he used, sorry, he used the Jews' unbelief so that the Gentiles could obtain mercy. And then he used the mercy given to the Gentiles, and that's us, if not most of us. The mercy given to us, remember, that through your mercy, through our mercy, that's how others are going to hear, right? And even here specifically, he speaks of the Jews to bring mercy to the Jews so that they might obtain, obtain mercy. God's putting a high premium on mercy here, isn't he? He wants people to obtain mercy. And that's about where we left off last week. But let's see now, looking at verse 32, let's see how God, what, how God brings this whole puzzle to a conclusion. Let's look at what it says. Romans eleven thirty two. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Now we've just been through three chapters of a whole lot of stuff, right? But when God brings it all together here, this is why God does what he does with mankind. This is why Israel was shown to be in unbelief. Did they fall just so that they could fall? Did they stumble just so that they could fall? God forbid. No, God wanted to use that for good. He wanted to use that to show his mercy so that others could believe. This is why the Gentiles were shown to be in unbelief, so that people from all around the world, both Jews and Gentiles, would, would see their true condition and would see then their need to obtain mercy. Nobody obtains mercy without first seeing their need to obtain mercy. Now, there are several amazing things. I'm just going to list them. We've been through a lot of this already. I'm just going to list them. Several amazing things that we can recognize from this and each really representing a piece of this magnificent puzzle. And this isn't the half of it, of course. But remember, Romans 9 through 11 is about Israel and its relationship to the gospel. Firstly, we found that Israel was chosen by God to be his representatives in the earth. Secondly, we saw that God used Israel as a picture of condemnation and salvation in bringing them out of Egypt through the Red Sea. God then used Israel's exodus as a means of declaring his name to the Gentiles. Remember Rahab? Remember how she had heard about what had happened in the Red Sea and that she knew who God was now and she wanted to follow him? Surely there were others like Rahab and her family. Fourthly, we saw that God used Israel as the vessel through which he would reveal and preserve his word. We saw that God used Israel as a showcase of his goodness and his mercy and his long-suffering and his forbearance. How, how God dealt with Israel over the hundreds of years is a demonstration of, of what God is like. God used Israel under the law to display types and shadows of Jesus Christ. God used the law, and he uses the law, today even, to bring the knowledge of sin. 
to establish God's righteous standard that we have failed to meet. If we did not have God's holy law, we would not be able to know what sin is. Paul said, right here in Romans, he said, I had not known sin but by the law. Well, that doesn't sound like fun. Why do we want to know what sin is? So that we can see how much we need God's mercy. God's use, God used Israel to establish prophecies concerning the Messiah and his future kingdom. God used Israel as the vessel through which the Son of God, the Savior of the world, would be born into this world. God used Israel then as the vehicle through which the Son of God, the Savior of the world, would be sacrificed on the behalf of all mankind. God used Israel to create a thirst in the unbelieving hearts of Gentiles who now did not want to miss out on what was going on, and they began to appreciate what the Jews did not appreciate. God then used the faith of the Gentiles to create thirst, to provoke to jealousy the unbelieving Jews that, that at least some might obtain mercy. This was done for the benefit of mankind as a picture of the faithfulness of God and the unfaithfulness of man. Now why? Why would we want a picture of the faithfulness of God, and especially why would we want a picture of our unfaithfulness, our unbelief? It's so that we find that answer in chapter, Romans chapter 10, so that we will stop trying to establish our own righteousness like Israel did. So we'll try to see that the hope of trying to establish our own righteousness before God is vain. It's impossible. We can't measure up. So that we will see that we are in such a, a desperate condition that we're in such desperate need of God's mercy. And friends, if you're without Christ at this very moment, your entire eternity is hanging by a thread. And that thread is the mercy of God. That's a picture that was painted, of course, by Jonathan Edwards in his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now some look at this verse, Romans eleven thirty two, 32, and they say, See, this is universal salvation. Everybody eventually obtains God's mercy and everybody goes to heaven. But that's not what it says. And certainly not what other scriptures say. You see, God indeed has had mercy upon all of us. In fact, if you're alive today, if you're living and breathing and you are without Christ, it is God's mercy that you are still here to have an opportunity to receive God's mercy. But if you refuse to repent... God's mercy has been made readily available. And, if, and you ref, if you refuse to obtain it, you will not obtain mercy and you will experience the wrath of God for your sins. You see, it's crucial that we see the importance of the first part of this verse, Romans eleven thirty two. 32. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief. Who is all there? Well, it's only anybody who is a Jew or a Gentile, that's it. <laughs> one of those two groups. If you're not in one of those two groups, you're, of course you are in one of those two groups. And if you are, that means it says here, through all these things God has shown, God has presented to us here in the book of Romans, that apart from Christ you are in unbelief, you're in your sins, and you're deserving, guilty, and worthy of his judgment. Now why is that so important to God's plan? because it is necessary for a person to see their great need for God's mercy before they'll ever be interested in God's mercy. Why would a person ever be interested in being presented a cure for a disease if they don't believe that they have that disease? One of the most merciful things that God has ever done for you was to show you that you are a sinner. Now that isn't fun, is it? That's not enjoyable. Was that enjoyable the first time you realized how God sees you apart from Christ? Not a happy thought, is it? But it was necessary. And in the same way, one of the most merciful things, and we saw this in verse 31, one of the most merciful things that you can do for another person, for another human being, is to use the scriptures, use even God's law, to show them their sinful condition. Now why? Why? Because we want people to feel bad? We just go, want to go around just making everybody feel bad? No. Maybe for a moment. <laughs> but we want them to obtain mercy. 
God wants them to obtain mercy. And the only way that will ever happen will be if they see that they need it. Now, if you're lost, if you're without Christ today, you probably utterly detest the idea of somebody trying to tell you about how you have sinned against God and how you're a guilty sinner. Most of us might remember a time when we hated the idea of somebody telling us that. But the truth is, if you're lost without Christ and somebody tells you that, we don't particularly enjoy telling you that either. But we know that it's necessary for you to see the bad news so that you can see that the good, how good the good news is, how necessary the mercy of God is, how wonderful, how, how, how delightful it is to see what God has done for you. Now this verse, in verse 32... It tells us another very important thing about God, and we've discussed this along the way, so I'm not going to say much about it. But God is not the author of sin. The evil that is in this world is not God's fault. That wicked thing that somebody did to you, God didn't do that. You might say, well, could God have stopped it? Yes, of course. But God doesn't always stop evil, as I'm sure you've noticed. But it's not that God is indifferent to the evil. It is that he would rather extend mercy than to just expunge evil from the earth. Do you realize, and I know I've said this to some of you before in the past, do you realize if God got rid of all the evil in the earth, do you know where that leaves us? We're gone too, right? God would have gotten rid of us the moment we sinned before we were ever saved. So God allows evil in his patience and long-suffering because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And yes, that evil does affect us. And yes, your sin affects others. And that, of course, became a curse upon the earth right from the beginning, right from the fall. If a person ends up in hell, it's not God's fault. It wasn't God's desire or his eternal purpose, clearly. From even this verse alone and many others, it wasn't God's desire or his eternal purpose to choose someone to damnation before the foundation of the world. It's God's purpose to show mercy to as many who will receive it. And sadly, many will not. Many do not. Narrow is the way, and few are they that find it. But it does say here in verse 32, the second half of the verse, that he might have mercy upon all. Have you obtained God's mercy? Have you received mercy? Christ alone as the only answer to your greatest dilemma? You know what your greatest dilemma is, right? This life is fast coming to an end and you don't know how fast and you don't know how long and you don't know, other than from the word of God, you wouldn't know what's on the other side. And if you knew what was on the other side, nothing else would matter to you right now. Life is so short and we're not guaranteed another minute. Yet people are going through their life acting as if walking the dog and watching Netflix are more important than eternity. Have you sought for God's mercy like you would seek for for diamonds if you knew they were somewhere in your backyard? You say, well, I have other things that I'm interested in. Like what? What's more important than eternity? You won't have things that you're more interested in on the day that you pass into eternity. On that day, I guarantee you won't be agonizing over whether you spent enough time on your investments or on your possessions or on your car or on games or on sports or on recreational activities. You won't be saying, why, oh, why didn't didn't I watch more Netflix? Why, oh, why didn't I scroll through Instagram another several hundred times? You'll be saying, why, oh, why didn't I seek God's mercy? It was right there for me all along, and I neglected it. You see, God does what he does for his own good purposes. And one of those purposes is for the good of mankind, our salvation. Even that which is evil in this world, even those things that have have grieved you in your life, God never does evil. God allows evil so that you'll see your great need for him. God is all-knowing. He knows how everything affects everything else. 
He knows how to use even the worst of events to have mercy on those who would receive it. God is all-powerful. There's nothing too hard for him. We saw in, in chapter 9 how he even used Pharaoh, the most evil, the most powerful man on the earth at that time. And he used it in such a way that would bring benefit to mankind and bring glory to himself. And he can certainly use evil. And he can certainly use whatever you're going through to bring benefit to you as well and use it for good. So God solves the puzzle. All of what we've learned over the past several months in chapters 9, 10, and 11, not to mention before that, and we come to find that God did all of that for the good of mankind, that we might obtain mercy and salvation, the mercy and salvation that we so desperately need. But is that really where it ends? Is that really the ultimate purpose of why God does what he does? Is the ultimate purpose of what God does centered around us, around mankind? Well, the salvation of sinners is an extremely important and wonderful part of God's plan. Even that is not the culmination of it all. You see, not everything God does is pointed toward us. In other words, we are not at the center of God's purposes. I'm going to say it again. We are not. Mankind is not at the center of God's purposes. Well, then what is? God himself. God is. God is at the center of his purposes. And as this amazing passage crescendos to its conclusion, we find that the Apostle Paul, who is usually quite composed, can't seem to contain himself any longer. Paul, upon seeing the wonder of God's work through Israel and through the gospel to the Gentiles, he erupts into glorious praise in verse 33. And here we find, demonstrated by Paul's response, we find the ultimate purpose of all things, the glory of God. So after receiving the revelation of God's plan of redemption through Jesus Christ and his dealings with Israel and with all mankind, Paul here in verse 33, he's filled with amazement and admiration and praise for God's wisdom. We see here it says in verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. The next uh, few things that I say here, I took not exact quote here, but I'm taking some of this from the Believer's Bible commentary. This concluding doxology looks back over uh, really the entire episode, really the entire epistle, and the divine wonders that have unfolded through this epistle. And Paul has just expounded the marvelous plan of salvation by which a just God can save ungodly sinners and still be just in doing so. He has shown how Christ has brought more glory to God and more blessing to men than Adam lost through his sin. He has explained, Paul has here, how grace produces holy living in the way that the law could never do. He has traced the unbreakable chain of God's purpose from foreknowledge all the way through to eventual glorification. He has set forth the doctrines of election and human responsibility, and he has traced the justice and harmony of God, of God's dispensational dealings with Israel and the nation. And now just with everything that we've seen, and I know it's been weeks and weeks that we've talked about this and looking through this passage, but nothing seems more appropriate at this, at this point to just burst forth in a song of praise for God's glory. And that's what Paul does here. We find here in verses 33 through 36, and don't worry, we're not trying to get through all this today. It's not going to happen. But we find here two exclamations, two examinations, and two acknowledgments. All a part of an, an astonished doxology something that gives glory to God, that points us to what matters more than anything else, what ought to matter to you and me more than anything else, and that is that God would be glorified. In other words, Paul's mind is blown by the truth of what God has just revealed. Has your mind ever been, been blown like that? Have you ever just been completely astonished 
by something that God just, about God, that just sort of kind of left your jaw on the ground? That's what happened here with Paul, even under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So after the, uh, this lengthy sequence uh, uh, we saw here in, in these chapters, 9, 10, and 11, after this lengthy sequence of objections and questions and counterpoints, upon its conclusion in verse 32, in verse 33, Paul finally exclaims what we see here, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. And the first, this first exclamation is over the fact that God's wisdom is infinite. That's the first half of the verse. And the second we see is because God's ways are incomprehensible. God's wisdom is infinite. God's ways are incomprehensible. So God's wisdom is infinite, and we probably won't get any further than this matter today. But there is an infinite depth to God's wisdom. Now, wisdom is uh, the Greek word, Sophia, why we named our, our, last, our youngest daughter, Sophia. That's the Greek word, wisdom, for wisdom is Sophia, and it refers to the skillful ability to take what is known and use it to manage the affairs of whatever situation it applies to. And here it shows that both God's wisdom and God's knowledge are infinitely deep. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. And in this book of Romans, we have just seen a glimpse. We've seen a lot, but it's still just a glimpse of how God uses his knowledge of all things to bring, bring redemption to mankind and to bring glory to himself. He did so in a way that was perfectly good. Jesus Christ came to, into a sinful world, born without sin, born of a virgin, and lived a life that was completely without sin. Salvation is offered to mankind in a way that perfectly expresses the love of God and the justice of God. Way back in Romans 3, verse 26, we saw this purpose where it says, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. That's a key verse, Romans 3.26. Key verse in this book showing that God is both just. We even talked about this in Sunday school a little bit. He is just and the justifier. He remains completely holy, completely just, and yet expressing his love to justify sinners through Jesus Christ. God also brought redemption. He brought salvation to mankind in a way that perfectly demonstrated the riches of his knowledge. God in his infinite wisdom, we've talked so, quite a bit about this in weeks past, God in his infinite wisdom was able to, from eternity past, have foreknowledge of every person who would ever live. God used that foreknowledge in a way that we don't completely comprehend to choose for his people those who would trust in him. He did all of that while allowing mankind to exercise his will and be responsible for his own choice to repent and believe the gospel message. And God brought redemption to mankind in such a way that perfectly demonstrated the fact that he is all-powerful. God is able to draw and direct the hearts of men and to manage the affairs of men in such a way that accomplishes all his purposes while allowing man to be responsible for his actions. The Bible says that God is able to work all things after the counsel of his will. And yes, God is even glorified in, the, in his judgment. He will be glorified in his wrath. He'll be glorified uh, when he comes in victory. We see here that God's wisdom is deep. It says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. God's wisdom is deep. The scriptures give us everything that we need to know about God. And it's a pretty thick book, isn't it? 66 books. It gives us everything. The Bible says all things that gives us, God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Pretty thick book. But yet, did you know that it barely scratches the surface of what there is to know about God? I believe that through all of eternity we'll never come to an end of learning and, under, and growing in our understanding of the greatness of God. Because, because it's infinite. It's deep, it's depth, there's, there's depth to it. There is no end to its depth. Over the last several months, at times, we have explored 
some very deep themes. I believe that we had to because they're right there in the Word of God. And I know at times there, there are some things that are difficult to wrap our heads around, including my head, and difficult for me to explain for that matter. But we don't do ourselves or God any favors when we just stay on the surface, like most of Christianity tries to do today. Christianity so clearly was never intended to be a shallow faith. What God has revealed to us is so profound. And we'll, we'll keep, like I said, keep learning throughout all of eternity, let alone our whole lives. 1 Corinthians 2.10 tells us that God has revealed them, these things, unto us by his Spirit. Talking about the Scriptures. And it goes on to say, For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Are you in awe of God? Or has he become dull and boring to you? If God is uninteresting to you, could I, could I suggest to you that the problem is not with God? There is nothing dull or dry or boring about God. His, his wisdom is infinitely deep. Perhaps God is uninteresting to you because you just stay on the surface. Perhaps you're like, most people who prefer a, a shallow religion that doesn't challenge their thinking, doesn't challenge their lifestyle, just stays on the surface, just kind of happy, light and fluffy, warm and fuzzies, peaches and cream. Perhaps you stay on the surface because it seems safer there, or it's easier. But if you stay on the surface, you miss so much. You miss so much of the riches of the treasure that is there in the word of God to, to understand of his, of his goodness, of who he is, and, and how to live your life for him to his glory. There are so many riches when you dive deep in understanding of God. Now, the Bible not only says that God's wisdom is deep, but it says here that God's wisdom is riches. Riches. It's a treasure. Again, verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Do you see God's word the wisdom that we find there, do you see it as a treasure? Do you see it as riches to you? Do you see it in the same way? I mentioned it before, uh, that if you knew there were diamonds in your backyard, you'd be out there on your hands and knees, you'd be out there digging, you'd be, your whole yard would be torn up, right? Is that what we're doing with our Bibles? we tearing through them, we going through them, looking for riches, looking for treasure, looking for God's wisdom. This refers both to the depth and the content of God's wisdom here. To know God's wisdom is greater riches than all the treasures in the world. Back in Romans 9.23, we, we find that God wants to make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. That's us. In Ephesians 1.7, we, 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 we see that in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Paul says in Ephesians 3, 8, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Are you availing yourself of this great treasure? Are you seeking the wisdom of God is, of all the information, the vast wealth, if you want to call it that, of information that's out there today, do you see as the greatest treasure in all that to find more and more treasure about God? Psalm 19.10 says, more to be, speaking of God's word, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Psalm 119.72 says, the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of of gold and silver. Thousands of gold and silver. He says God's word's worth more. Psalm 119, 127. Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Proverbs 3, 13. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Anything that you can desire, it says all of them, doesn't say any, all of them put together are not to be compared to what you, the treasure that you find, the riches, or the wisdom of God. Proverbs 
It says, wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. Proverbs 16, 16, it says, it exclaims, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver? What would be your choice if you had to choose between, a, between the gold in Fort Knox or the wisdom of God? Which would you choose? Which of all the things that you enjoy, all the things that you desire put together, which would you choose? Those things or the wisdom of God found in the scriptures? When it's all said and done, we see, and we will see, we'll, we'll have to continue this, but we will see that God's wisdom and his knowledge and his power and his goodness all work together to perfectly carry out his plans. And God gives us just a glimpse of it right here in the scriptures. And God wants us to go deep and find the treasure. He wants us to take time and spend time in his word, not just to do your Bible time. Oh, I did it. I did. I read some words. He wants us to look for treasure and to see the wisdom that's there. Ephesians 3.10, I read it before. It says, God's intent for the churches, God's intent for his people. It says, to the intent that now, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. God wants us to know. And yes, we're, they're past finding out. It's unsearchable. We'll talk more about that next week. But there's more that we can learn. There's more that we can know. Have you been making the depths of God's wisdom your treasure? If you haven't, can I encourage you to seek God's truth, to seek his word, to seek God as you would for buried treasure, as you would for rubies, as you would for silver and for gold. And what you'll find will bring you if, you, if you found the Lord to be dull or dry or boring, maybe it's because you haven't been digging. Maybe it's because you haven't been, been looking. Maybe it's because you're getting caught up in vain things of this world that, 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 that tantalize. They look very attractive, but they'll be nothing to us in eternity. Won't we seek the Lord? If you're here today and, and you haven't obtained God's mercy, you may have wanted to believe you're a Christian, but you'd have to recognize, I never saw it that way. You might think, I never saw it where I'm a sinner that, that needed the mercy of God more, and more than anything else that was without hope. And perhaps today you need to see that you need to cry out to God for mercy. That's exactly what Christ demonstrated on the cross when he paid the price with his blood was so that you could be set free from your sin, set free to, to live for God, to know him, to enjoy him and to, to know his wisdom for all of eternity. So if you need to, to come to know Christ today, if you need to be saved, if you don't already know what to do and repent and believe the gospel, talk to me afterwards. I'd be happy to show you. Many people here would be happy to show you from God's word how you can obtain the mercy of God. Let's stand together for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you. Can't thank you enough for solving the puzzle, Lord puzzle we could not solve we could never we would never have even dreamt up this plan let alone been able to to lay it out we recognize you are an all holy righteous god perfectly good we recognize that you are all powerful you're there's nothing too hard for you we recognize that you're all knowing you know everything from the beginning to the end you're the Alpha and the Omega. And Lord, we ask that you'd help us to treasure, to treasure you and the truth that you give above anything this world has to offer. So Father, we pray that during this time of invitation that you'd bless our hearts with understanding of how we ought to respond. You'd help us to see how uh, we might need to repent of some things. We might need to repent of idols that we've put ahead of your riches. There might be somebody who needs to repent and believe the gospel. Or we, some of us just might need to cry out in awe and, and, and praise, just like Paul does here, and just praising you uh, for what a great God you are. We ask, Father, you'd help us now during this time.
to recognize your purpose for our lives. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn in our songbooks now to number 150. Number 150, a song that hopefully expresses the truth that not only is in God's word, but in our hearts. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Let's sing together. If you need to do business with God, I encourage you to find a place to do it right where you're at, but do business with God during this invitation. second. 